One of the ways I can tell a rookie network engineer has been on the job is when spanning tree has been left to default. Let's fix that. In this diagram, we've got three switches, two core switches and a closet switch that is dual uplinked, one link to each of those core switches. And in this configuration, what do we notice? We notice we've got a loop. Core one connects to core two, which connects to closet switch one, which goes back to core one. And loops are a no-no in ethernet networks. You can't have them, uh, ethernet can't handle that. The network will go down in the face of a loop. So the job of spanning tree is to prevent loops. Spanning tree switches discover one another and then decide if there's a loop in the topology, which link is going to be blocked, making the topology loop-free. That is what spanning tree does. Spanning tree doesn't cause loops. You don't shut spanning tree off because I heard that spanning tree causes loops and therefore I'm going to shut off spanning tree because it's dangerous. No, no, you don't want to do that. You want to leave spanning tree on, but you want to control it. You want to manage it. And I've seen far too many times that spanning tree has been left to defaults what can happen if you leave spanning tree to default? So let's walk through our diagram here and take a look. Spanning tree switches here, as they all talk to one another, they're trying to accomplish a couple of things. One, they are trying to determine who the root bridge will be. A bridge is a switch, so think of a switch, bridge, it's the same thing. They're trying to determine who the root bridge will be, and then once they figure that out, they're going to figure out the fastest path to get to that root bridge and block links that are not fastest path. In this case, we've got core one, core two, and closet one switches all left to their defaults, which means uh, what? Well, Spanning tree switches have priorities, and the default priority that each of those switches are given is 32768. If all of the switches have the same priority, there's some kind of a tiebreaker that has to take effect to determine who the root bridge is going to be, and that will be the lowest bridge ID. Well, who's got the lowest bridge ID? I don't know. Let's say it's the closet switch has the lowest bridge ID, and therefore the closet switch is going to become root. He is our spanning tree root bridge. What's the second job that spanning tree is going to do? He's going to determine the fastest path back to root bridge. If we look at core one, core two, and the closet switch, what, what are our links? What are we working with here? Each of those links represents a cost. You want to take the lowest cost to get from where you are to where the root bridge is. So in this case, what's the lowest cost? Well, I've got a cost of the 10 gig plus the cost of the 1 gig if I were to go from core 1 to core 2 to the closet switch. If I was to go from core 1 directly to closet 1 via the 1 gig link, that's going to be a lower cost. 1 gig plus 10 gig uh, gives me a higher cost than the 1 gig directly. All right. What about from core 2's perspective? Who would be the fastest path to root for him. Well, same thing. One gig is going to be the direct link because it's going to be costlier to go via the 10 gig backbone link and then across the one gig link over to the closet switch. So we know we've established something that Spanish tree calls the root port for each of those switches. Core 1's root port will be here. Core 2's root port will be here. What about the closet switch, the root switch? Does he have root ports also? Well, no, the fastest path back to himself is himself. He doesn't go across any links, so there's no root ports there that we need to designate in that case because he is the root bridge. Nothing for him to think about in that case. So we've got a couple of ports left. We've got uh, the, the, the one link here between core one and core two. Now you might know instinctively, all right, so Spanish is going to end up blocking this link, right? Yes, he is. Uh, what will happen here is that Core 1 and Core 2 will need to decide which of the ports are, is going to be the blocked port, in effect blocking the entire link. There is a process that we're not going to go through that elects which port is going to be our blocked port. Let's just say, for sake of illustration, that our blocked port is on Core 2. That effectively blocks the entire link, and now we have a loop-free topology. Why is what I've just illustrated here a problem? Well, this is a design issue uh, in this particular case. We've got a closet switch with a couple of 1 gig links and a high-speed 10 gig link that's not being used because Spanning Tree blocked it. Oh, that's not good, is it? No, it certainly is not. 
So how do we fix this situation? How do we make the topology what we want it to be? And you might think, ah, the priority, right? Because you said the 32768s were a tie and so it went to the lower bridge ID to, to, to be our tiebreaker and that's why closet one ended up as root. Right, and you're exactly right. You're gonna pick some switch you want in the topology to be your root bridge, assign a lower bridge priority to that switch and then you will have uh, a new spanning tree topology with the root where you want it to be so that forwarding happens the way you want it to be. Let's take a look. So here's the same topology again. Let's say that we've assigned our own uh, bridge priorities. Why did I pick 8192 and not the number 5? Root bridge priorities start at zero and go in increments of 4096. So 0, 4096, uh, 8192, uh, whatever the 12,000 number would be, 16384, etc. Core switch 2 and closet switch 1 to be 32768. My root bridge will be core 1. He's got the lowest priority. Bridge ID doesn't come into play here because priority is all we need to decide. Lower bridge ID only matters if we need a tiebreaker. So we'll keep the links the same. We got a 10 gig link and a couple of one gig links. And now if I look at this and I remember my costs, I'm going for the lowest cost path to get me back to root. The lowest cost path for closet one is going to be uh, that port. Uh, core two, his lowest cost is going to be uh, that port. So now I've got my two root ports assigned. Where, what's that leave me with? Well, I've got this one oddball one gig link here. And one end of that link or the other is going to end up in a block state, which effectively takes the whole link out of the equation. Let's say that it ended up being on the closet switch, that we have our blocked link effectively taking that link out of the equation, and now we have a loop-free topology. So this looks good. Uh, uh, we've got some, uh, uh, some good things going on here. Uh, traffic between switches is going to go between core switch 1 and core switch 2. Uh, I don't have anything weird like I had in the first diagram. In the first diagram, I had traffic trying to get from core one to core two via this closet switch, really slowing things down, kind of a suboptimal path, not good at all. So if you have this problem on your network, you're going, yay, I have my answer. I know how to deal with this. I'm going to take my core switch or some switch you know is the right answer. Make him your uh, lowest uh, priority, 8192. Let's say you pick that one and, uh, and then life's going to be good. Everything's going to now flow the way you want it to. Wait a second. Don't do that. Uh, not during production hours because something's going to happen here. So let's go back to our first topology, the one with the problem. And you might think, okay, I know how to fix that. I'm gonna make one of my switches a lower bridge priority. And let's say for our illustration, we decided to make him 16384. Yay, what's gonna happen? You're gonna have an outage and it's gonna be awful because 16384 will become the root bridge and that's good. It is gonna do what you want, but when it does it, all of the other switches in the topology will note, oh, there's a new root bridge. If there's a new root bridge, everyone is going to go through a listening and a learning uh, state before it ends up in a forwarding state, meaning <laughs> you're not passing traffic through this VLAN for a little while while Spanning Tree decides everything's good again. He knows who the new root bridge is, elects his root ports, and begins forwarding, uh, has another port that's been blocked so that it's a loop-free topology, etc. All of that takes time. How long does it take? It takes anywhere from many seconds to as much as roughly a minute. You need to look up, are you running classic spanning tree? Are you running a rapid spanning tree? And look at the timers that are set up and then come to a conclusion in your mind about how long that it should take. While it is taking the time to do that, you are going to have bad things happening on your network. Servers aren't going to be able to talk to one another. People are going to be getting upset. They're just going to see a lot of strange things happening. What is going on? And what's going on is you if you're doing this during production. So don't do this in that way. You need to schedule a maintenance window to make a significant spanning tree topology change like this. The results will get you where you want to go. It's definitely worthwhile. And you're like, ah, eh, I don't know. I don't know that it really is worthwhile because now you scared me. Now I don't know that I really want to do this thing. Y you do, and here's why. If you leave this to default, 
every time you introduce a new switch into this VLAN, you have the chance that a new root bridge is going to be elected. Let's give us an example here. In purple, I'm going to draw uh, a new closet switch. I'm actually 32760 out on all four switches for purposes of my example here. Closet switch two comes online. He also has that bridge prior of 32768. They're all tied. Everything's tied up. We got to go to our tiebreaker. What is the tiebreaker? It is going to be the lower bridge ID. What if it so happens that closet switch two is the low bridge ID? Well, this closet switch used to be the root bridge. Now he's no longer the root bridge. Closet well, switch two becomes the root bridge. And just like when you change the bridge ID and cause a new root to come into the topology, you will cause the same kind of an event again just by bringing closet switch two online because it so happened that his bridge ID was lower and you have a temporary loss of forwarding for that VLAN while spanning tree converges and everybody freaks out and they're all pointing at you and what happened and you happened and you get your resume updated and it's all sad and don't do it, don't do it. And in other words, now what I'm really trying to do here is justify why you want to get control of your spanning tree domain. You don't want a new other switch popping on the wire and causing an outage, that should never happen. If you have set one of the switches to be a low bridge priority, uh, he's always gonna be root bridge. He will remain root bridge. You can add new switches to the topology, no root bridge change will happen because you've controlled, you've gotten a handle on what your spanning tree topology is supposed to be. If he's the lowest bridge priority, I just drew 8192 up there, he's lower than these other ones, and he's lower than anybody else you're gonna add and what their defaults are, and so he will remain root bridge. A new switch comes online, there's no change to the spanning tree topology because the root bridge remains the same, no convergence event will happen, you can do it safely. So it's not okay to leave spanning tree alone if you've got an environment where you're adding switches or you're risking downtime. So the right thing to do is always rig those elections. Don't be a rookie out there. Fix your spanning tree.